In this episode, I speak with Jonathan Castillo. Jonathan is the regional director for the San Diego arm of a California-based charity called PATH. PATH is an acronym which stands for People Assisting the Homeless. In this episode, we chat about the major homelessness crisis in California, we touch on mental health's role in it, and we talk about what PATH is doing to help the problem, specifically in San Diego. This episode was recorded in two sessions. Um, I've done my best to make the listen as seamless as possible. Um, at one point in the conversation, we mention a short video about the PATH outreach program. Um, I provided a link to that video in the post with this episode at theewpodcast.com. Um, in that post, there will also be some links to PATH online, and I recommend you check them out if you're interested. So here's my conversation with Jonathan Castillo from PATH. Okay, so I'm here with Jonathan Castillo. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Um, can we get started with who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So I'm a social worker by profession. Uh, I, I got into this line of work because I've always had a passion for, for helping others. And I think where my passion really lies is uh, advocating for people who really have difficulty advocating for themselves um, and serving marginalized populations. Um, I... I began my work in child protective services, working with um, children that were dependents of the court, uh, trying to reunify with their parents. Um, and then I eventually got into, uh, did a little work in, in mental health, uh, providing uh, individual therapy, and eventually was exposed to working with veterans. Um, I used to work at the VA hospital um, uh, in a permanent supportive housing program, which is basically um, long-term housing for veterans with chronic and acute medical mental health needs. And that was really my first exposure to, to homeless programs and working with people experiencing homelessness. Um, and, and eventually from there, I uh, continued to draw upon that experience and, and started working with the general homeless population um, and joined PATH. And, and now I'm in uh, San Diego running their, their San Diego region and, um, you know, in, in this market, we are actually providing um, uh, services to individuals, families, and veterans. Um, and in San Diego, we have um, a shelter program, we have outreach employment programs, and uh, supportive housing programs as well. Um, how did you initially hear about PATH and start working with them? Were they someone that, in your work as a social worker, you had worked with before, or were they someone you sought out? What was that? Like, yeah, so my um, my first encounter Pat, with PATH was actually when I was at the VA hospital. Um, I, I worked, as I mentioned earlier, in one of the departments in the VA that was specifically focused on uh, providing homeless services. Um, during that time uh, that I worked there, PATH actually became a contractor to the VA providing um, case management and supportive services to veterans experiencing homelessness who... Uh, were moving into permanent housing. And um, they were the largest contractor during that time for providing that, that type of service. And uh, eventually PATH you know, gave me an opportunity to be uh, their director of veteran programs. And so I oversaw uh, that particular contract as well as other services that they had to offer veterans. Hmm. Interesting, so let's go into PATH now. Um, what is PATH, what sets it apart they're an organization that works with the homeless and tries to help them out, but how? Yeah. So PATH stands for People Assisting the Homeless. Uh, we've been around for approximately 37 years, 36, 37 years. We started off in the Los Angeles area, actually in West LA, and it was really a, a grassroots movement. Um, it was a number of um, faith faith-based folks that, that wanted to take matters into their own hands to address some of the homeless issues that were going on in West Los Angeles during that time. It originally started off with uh, street feedings, actually, because um, that's what they saw um, the biggest need being. But over time, they saw that there were other needs that um, uh, needed to be addressed. And so they opened up shelter programs, which eventually led into outreach and to... Um, 
uh, the, the organization that we are now. Um, and so PATH has um, a large portfolio of services that we have to offer. Um, and one of the, the, the key pieces about us is that we have, um, as I mentioned earlier, shelter, outreach, uh, employment services, uh, a wide range of different types of, of housing services. And we also work with um, a wide range of populations as well. We, we specialize in working with families, with veterans, with individuals, um, with some transi- transitional age youth. Um, we are a large statewide organization. Uh, you know, we have a presence in Los Angeles, San Diego, Santa Barbara, and San Jose. One of the, the unique things about PATH that distinguish us uh, from, from many other organizations is that we have, we have two arms. We have PATH, which is really focused on providing the, the services, and then we have PATH Ventures, which is our development arm. So this, this, this arm is completely focused on uh, building and developing permanent supportive housing. And so we actually have about 11 permanent supportive housing uh, apartments throughout the state. Um, with many more on the way. Um, and, and the reason why PATH started uh, PATH Ventures was because they saw that the way to end homelessness was by creating more doors and felt like that was a critical piece to our mission. Have you, obviously you've seen some success with the methods you've adopted um, through PATH Ventures. Is that something that's been adopted by other organizations as well? Are you kind of setting an example of how this can be a, a, a situation that is addressed? Yeah. So we are fortunate because um, a lot of other homeless service organizations partner with other developers to build permanent supportive housing. And PATH does the same as well. We, we in, in addition to building our own permanent supportive housing uh, projects, uh, we also will partner with other developers. Uh, you know, so uh, we are unique in the sense that not a lot of homeless service organizations are, are doing the development themselves. Right. Okay. So it's, it's not totally uncommon for this to be the way that uh, an organization is looking to help the homeless. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but how, how many shelters uh, do you have in San Diego, for example? Uh, in San Diego, we, we have one shelter. Uh, we have 134 uh, beds for, for men and women that we have to offer. Is it currently full? It is. Um, you know, obviously there's a very high need uh, for shelter beds in San Diego. We have 8,100 people experiencing homelessness throughout the county with about 5,000 of them being in the city limits. Um, you know, and so uh, a, a significant portion of the 8,100 are, are unsheltered, meaning that they're on the streets. And so they're in need of um of, of temporary roof over their head. And so really the purpose of the shelter, um, is to position people better to get connected to the resources that are going to help them, uh, obtain permanent housing, get connected to medical mental health services and uh, establish their income. With, um, less than 200 beds and so many homeless people in need, how do you, um, ensure that the turnover rate is high enough that you're Get helping a lot of people, but not so fast that you're hurting people that you're trying to help. That is a real challenge. Um, you know, under the old way of operating shelters for, for many communities, they're very much focused on um, having a hard uh, 90 days that somebody could spend at a shelter. But, you know, San Diego right now is experiencing a housing crisis. And so, holding people to a 90 day mark is not, uh, uh, realistic. And so as, as a, as a program, we're very flexible in recognizing that we have to be more fle- uh, flexible to give people the time they need to, um, get situated so they can obtain permanent housing. Um, but that is a, a real challenge that we come up against. But what we've learned is that if we stick hard to after 90 days, uh, you have to leave the program. We're really uh, setting people back a lot of steps and, and um, really becomes discouraging to the people we serve. And so we have um, seen time and time again and have learned that it's better to uh, be flexible and work at a pace that's a little bit more client centric to help them obtain uh, their own place. So do you have a limit on how long someone can stay? 
as long as they are making progress towards um, a, a meeting their goals, obtaining housing, uh, um, establishing income, we have flexibility. On average, uh, I would say that people are staying in our shelter about 124 days. Okay. So whenever they're staying at the shelter, do they um, actively have a checklist or specific things that they have to meet? Or is it kind of just uh, work towards getting a job? And then once you secure a job, we'll talk. Or are there you know, little small steps that they have to achieve along the way to stay in as well? Yeah. So while they're in the shelter, they do receive case management services. And the case management services are highly individualized. It's looking at uh, what are the the resources and services needed that will address the root causes of why they became homeless and uh, ultimately help them um, get back to a place where they can move into their own apartment? Okay. So the first step is identifying mm-hmm. what's going on. Right. So that could be mental health, right? Be medical, medical. It can be employment. Um, you know, it, it can be a wide range of things. What is the most prevalent? cause or the pr- most prevalent issue that needs addressed? Yeah. I mean, we're living in a, I, I've been in homeless services for about 10 years now and you know, our, our economy and our housing market is, um, is a really tough situation for a lot of individuals and families to, to survive in. And so right now, I mean, we're seeing uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, for a a number of reasons, whether it's loss of employment, whether it's medical, mental health, um, or, or just simply being, um, you know, squeezed out of of the housing market. I mean, right now, um, for somebody who has full-time employment and a a solid job, it's hard for them to pay rent. I mean, the only way that they can keep up with it is if they are, um, doubling up and they have roommates, you know? And so, it becomes a real challenge for people that maybe that don't have the resources or the network where they can rely on on people and double up in apartments or have roommates. And so what often ends up happening is that you have property management companies or landlords um, that are increasing rent at a rate at which people cannot keep up with. And so they end up on the streets. And I think we're seeing that more in the last few years than we ever have before. Hmm. So th- just to kind of go back to a point that you made in that statement, these are people who maybe don't have the network around them or the support system around them to help them in a situation like paying rent or, you know, a mental health situation. Are the, is that generally true for the homeless people you see is that they come from kind of a isolation or an isolated um, social and familial standing before they're homeless? Absolutely. So the the number one question as a homeless service provider that we get so often is what causes homelessness? And um, usually when we ask that question to the community, what do you perceive to create a, a homeless situation? People, you know, usually will list off a number of things that um, uh, seem to be pretty assumptive, such as, you know, drugs. Um, you know, it's... Um, uh, mental illness, medical issues, loss of employment, and, and th- that is the the cause of homelessness. But I, what I what I like to remind people is, many of us have um, family or friends in our own lives that have experienced everything that I have just listed off, but never hit the streets. And the reason why they don't hit the streets is because they have a support system and resources that they can connect to that um, position them well to never have to resort to the streets. Mm. So what really causes for people to become homeless is the complete separation from their support system and resources. So what about after someone has gone through the PATH program um, and you know they've gotten back on their feet? Are you maintaining contact with them still to you know maintain that kind of support and feeling of having a resource there that you spent so long to build? Yeah. So depending on, on the type of program that they're connected to. So uh, uh, taking a step back, homeless uh, services and programs are often, um, you know, sort of governed or dictated by, by the funding source. And so depending on, 
on uh, the funding source that um, is available for the program determines what type of services we can provide after they move into their own uh, apartment. And so typically a lot of services are looking at providing about six months to one year of um, services uh, after they move into their own apartment, unless they live in what we call permanent supportive housing um, within a project uh, site apartment um, where the case management services are long-term. Um, so kind of varies on the program, but ideally the longer that we can spend time after they move into their apartment is, is ideal because you know, the many times the causes of homelessness are so deeply rooted that um, it requires for people to have longer term case management supported services. Mm -hmm. So in terms of getting those support services, like their access to mental health care, that's provided and funded through the path through path, right? They don't, that's not an out of pocket cost. So path doesn't them. provide uh, medical and mental health services directly. Uh, we help provide the linkages and the connections uh, to behavioral health service providers and to medical providers to make sure that they're able to establish their care there and uh, ensuring that they're able to make their appointments so that way they can continue to um, maintain that medical and mental health uh, stability long term. Okay. And how successful is PATH in general? Like, what do you guys have a number on um, your success rate? Yeah, so um, very successful as uh, statewide, um, looking at all of our, our data for permanent supportive housing, about 90% of the people that uh, move into their own apartments continue to reside in their own apartments. Wow. Um, locally in San Diego, um, our, our permanent supportive housing, our housing programs are at a 90% rate. And uh, if you're asking, you're probably wondering what, what happens to the other 10%. What we find is that about 5% are, are moving on from our programs because they no longer have a need for case management services. So it's a positive outcome. Um, and then the other 5% um, sometimes move on, move on for adverse reasons. Mm. 90% is really good. Yeah, really good. That's really impressive. That's yeah, a number we're proud of. Yeah. And so the general uh, term or I guess time of being in the program from start to finish is typically two years. It's tough to say. I mean, it really depends on um, the individual. But so ideally, if, you know, somebody is in our program for 90 to 134 days, at that point, they can move in into, um, you know, their own place. But there's there's a number of factors that really impact that. Like sometimes it's really difficult for some individuals to establish their income or um, the um, the housing market, like I said earlier, there, it's very limited on what's available. And for some of the people that we serve, they can live in um, uh, fair, mar uh, fair market housing um, where they can rent from landlords like you and I can. Um, but there's a, there is a segment of the population that really uh, rely on um, subsidized housing or affordable mm -hmm. housing. And uh, the inventory for, for uh, uh, subsidized and affordable housing is very, very low. And so that's where it becomes more challenging is that we can position people well all day long to get ready to move into affordable housing uh, or to live on their own. But if, if those units do not become available, then sometimes our, uh, the people we serve are, are really in a limbo. Mm -hmm. Is that a number, th that inventory, is that something that's growing? It or is that like, how does that become a bigger number? Yeah. Um, it's growing, but not fast enough. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the reality. Um, path actually, um, partners with affirmed housing and they are, uh, a developer, um, that, that builds a lot of affordable housing. And we just, uh, in partnership with them opened up an 84 unit permanent supportive housing project for veterans. Um, uh, but again, that's, that's just not enough. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of developers right now that are focused on, on building units, but the rate at which we're building is not happening. And so there, I think there's a lot of, um, service providers and partners that are out there looking for creative opportunities to find alternatives to building housing. So it's just not focused on, on permanent supportive housing. So some of, uh, you know, those, those ideas is the concept of, uh, 
um, like micro units, you know, or, um, what's a micro unit, a micro unit is a, a style of apartments that are becoming, um, pretty popular in different communities, uh, where the units will be anywhere from about two to 300 square feet. Okay. And, and these are actually uh, styles of living that, um, you know, people, really enjoy to live in and, and, um, not just for, for, um, specialized populations, but you know, a lot of people just prefer to have a little bit more simplicity and usually the common spaces within micro units have, um, uh, they're shared. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a dormitory style. Similar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is that, is the, community of home of organizations working with the homeless kind of and especially in California now feeling the pressure where you are being forced to think outside the box and figure out um, you know if we can't get this housing what can we do is are we kind of at that point now where you know plan B and C need to be enacted oh absolutely I mean I think uh, you know more than ever before there is a heightened sense of awareness of how serious this problem is. And uh, elected officials, there's a lot of synergy right now amongst um, elected officials to address this uh, problem in a way um, that is more impactful because it's it's impacting communities all around us. And even a, a part of my role in this work that I do is to do a lot of community education around homeless issues. and. Um, a lot of the time that I spend talking to, uh, different residents and homeowners, uh, people are more well-informed around what the issues of, uh, homelessness are, uh, because it's really, it's beginning to come into their own communities. And so people mm -hmm. are, are informing themselves of what needs to be done. Um, another question I wanted to ask you is, do you know what the most uh, prevalent mental illness is among the homeless people you serve? Is there a diagnosis that seems to come up more than others? You know, that's a really tough question to answer because a lot of the data that we have on mental illness um, amongst the homeless population is really uh, from self-reports. And what that basically means is that the surveys and the data collection that we're doing, we're asking people experiencing homeless whether or not they have a history of, of mental illness. And so that response is heavily weighted upon the person's own awareness of their mental illness. So if somebody is not engaged in mental health services and you ask them that question, they're going to say most likely no, because they're unaware of something that may or may not be going on with them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I would, I would, uh, uh, argue and say that mental illness is more prevalent amongst people experiencing homelessness than the data shows. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So is one of the first steps then to recognize and identify a mental illness? I know you're connecting them with the clinicians, but is that in your process uh, a, a top priority whenever you Absolutely. get someone in the program? Absolutely. Because um, you can't uh, determine the level of need for services until you understand, um, you know, the, the, the person holistically what's going on with their medical and their mental health issues. And so in order to do that, sometimes you need a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a, it's an absolute challenge that I think, um, homeless services needs more of is behavioral health expertise and access to, to behavioral health services. Would you say the biggest challenge you face in helping people is kind of the um, unknown histories you're dealing with? And, you know, whenever people come into you, like you say, and they have never been um, registered in homeless services or mental health services, they have no idea what is going on with them, essentially. Is that, is that would you say that's the biggest challenge you have in helping a specific person? It's just... It, it, it's... It's one of the, the biggest challenges. Uh, we have a program uh, right now uh, that provides services to the highest util utilizers of healthcare services. Our referrals come primary through he primarily healthcare providers. Um, PATH, as a homeless service provider, what we're doing is we're, we're running from various um, uh, 
service systems, whether or not these high utilizers have engaged in services. And what we're finding is of the referrals that we're getting from the healthcare sector, about 40% of, of the referrals that we receive are a people who have a history of homelessness, but have not engaged with homeless services in two years or more or ever. Hmm. And, and what we're finding a lot with this population is that um, they are disconnected a lot of times from most services. So the only time that they're accessing, accessing anything is in the ER or when they're being hospitalized. So whenever you're approaching homeless people that you've targeted as, um, you know, someone that you think would benefit from your program or be receptive to it is the presentation of the services you can provide one of the things you lead with, or are you going a different route? You know, how are you opening the door? We go a different route. Um, we're heavily focused on first establishing trust and a relationship with the people that we serve. Um, what I, what I always like to remind people is putting the experience of homelessness um, uh, through your own lens. How would you feel if one day you were approached by someone and they said, um, would you like this service because this is the service that I think you would be most appropriate or would be most helpful for you? The likelihood is very slim, you know, especially if you have your own priori priorities um, and your own needs. Uh, and oftentimes people aren't willing to just freely share what their medical mental health issues or even maybe substance related issues are because they don't know you and they don't feel comfortable. And it's not until you establish that trust and that relationship, they're able to um, get people to open up. But as clinicians and as service providers, get to know them better to understand what their needs are. I watched the the Jesse and Mickey video the, with the outreach. That was really cool. I re yeah. That's a... Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what he's doing and um, I go a little more into detail about the outreach program? Sure, sure. So this is a really cool project that is really setting the model for what street outreach should look like. And what's exciting about this particular uh, um, program, the Business Improvement District in North Park and City Heights said that um, they wanted to take matters into their own hands and create a solution to address homelessness in their business improvement district areas. So North Park and City Heights came together and, and brought together some funding to say, we're going to create um, a position and, and work with PATH to provide street outreach in our own communities. And so what's different from this, this uh, program is that we're very, very much focused on being relationship first. A lot of the homeless services uh, or street outreach service providers sometimes um, offer services, um, but there may not be a lot of follow up um, and relationship building with the people that they're offering services to because they just don't have the bandwidth. You know, they might be covering a very, very large coverage area that doesn't allow for them to create those relationships. So what this what this program is doing is by narrowing the the coverage area to to two different business improvement districts, we're able to get to know the community very very intimately. We know who um, uh, I would say most, if not all, the people are who are experiencing homelessness on the streets in those communities, and uh, we work with them one on one um, to make sure that we're getting them connected to the services that they need and that they prioritize. And so this video that um, that you were just referencing is a mini um, documentary of our, our outreach specialist, Jesse, providing support to um, a client of his who's living in North Park that um, does not have any significant medical issues, mental health, and um, doesn't struggle with substances, is educated, mm -hmm. but is just really struggling living in a community like San Diego that is thriving for many but for those that have economic challenges, it really um, puts them behind and, and into difficult situations. And so this mini documentary is um, following the two of them uh, in their journey of navigating the system. And um, it's not a, a happy ending sort of uh, uh, documentary. It's basically showing the challenges that um, people who are on the streets go through trying to navigate the system. and and. What's unique about this is that many times the people that we serve are trying to navigate the system on their own, but um, this particular um, uh, situation, uh, he's getting support from an outreach specialist 
that's even having difficulty navigating mm-hmm. the system. And so I think it, this this documentary puts perspective into the complexity that's involved mm-hmm. um, for people who are experiencing street uh, homelessness. It's just not that easy to say, um, you know, go get help over in this area and, and that will resolve your issues. Yeah, that's an interesting point. He has Jesse helping him who is not homeless and yet they're still get making a pointless trip to go f- fill out a form or something and getting turned away and getting caught up in the system. And he's learning these things at the same time Mickey is. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, an interesting right. point. One thing that I found interesting about that was that uh, Mickey had never been uh, typed into any service, homeless services before. He was a first timer. So that just speaks to, I guess, the difficulty you guys have in just getting people to know what exists and what's out there. Right. Yeah. I think, and thank you for pointing that out. And, and that's, that's another thing that path is really looking at that many communities are set up in a way that we're able to help a large number of people who are experiencing homelessness, but there's a lot of individuals um, that are not even being seen by our system. And um, what, one of the things that we're tracking as an organization is how many people can we serve that we know have a history of homelessness but have never accessed services. And so um, this particular client is an example of that, that he's somebody that has been on the streets for a good amount of time mm-hmm. but, but has never been engaged by a homeless service provider um, and so really has has continued to remain on the streets because of that because he just doesn't know of what's out there yeah i guess that's more of a commentary on the organizations than it is him in a way right. who's out there trying to help him right um how difficult is it for jesse to maintain a relationship at that level and also maintain his other you know everything else going on is he seeing other clients as well or is it or outreach specialists just seeing one person and helping them and then seeing the next how does that yeah look yeah. like that, that's another um intentional design of our service delivery model um at path we're very much focused on it's not about serving large volumes of people we're really focused on serving uh, quality services. And so part of what allows for us to be able to provide services at a, uh, at the level that Jesse is doing is the fact that we do not overcommit to saying that we're going to serve this X amount of people that, that what we're focused on is that we're going to serve people that are harder to reach and we're going to have a lower workload for, for our, our staff who are providing those services to make sure that they're able to provide the the persistent and frequent services that are really required. Mm-hmm. Was Mickey a rare case? Like it seemed as though, you know, like you said, he's not using substance, was very smart, intelligent. He had a job. Is that a, a rare, a rare thing? Mickey's not a rare case. Um, you know, and I think that's what's really um, why we wanted to highlight Mickey is because there's sometimes a misconception that, you know, people experiencing homelessness all look a certain way. And, and I think that's part of what we wanted to prove. So imagine somebody who, who may not be as eloquent, as educated, um, and as intelligent, you know, as, as Mickey is, and to even have the insight, he said a lot of profound things. Yeah. That that quote about looking at yourself Mm -hmm. in another person, I had to run that back and listen to it again. I was like, wow, that was really, Mm -hmm. really deep very profound person and he still struggled and so if you think about somebody who um is is uh uh, struggles a little bit more with medical or mental health issues or just even being able to express themselves um it becomes even that more challenging and i think that's what we were trying to highlight Mm -hmm. is the story going to continue is there going to be more you know, it's to be determined. I mean, we're, yeah. we're really hoping that we're watching it closely and, and we're, um, you know, we think regardless of, of what the outcome is, his story is important to continue to share. So is Jesse seeing other clients or he is? He is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he works with about 25 clients in um, the city Heights and North Park area. Okay. And the, the reason that number is set at that uh, number, you know, because that generally speaking i would say that that's a higher number but because he's working in a very small proximity he's able to to manage those numbers but typically what you are looking at um is about a a 15 uh person workload to a 20 person workload in order in order to provide that type of quality services um what kind of things 
or pointers, I guess, are you giving your outreach specialists um, when it comes to having a fruitful interaction with someone who's homeless? Mm -hmm. Are there things that can be taken away for people who live in a city where there's homeless? Because I know for me personally, walking around and seeing homeless, you know, you want to help. Where's the line? How do you draw it? And how do you have a positive interaction while still keeping yourself safe? Right, right. Yeah, you, what we talk to our, our our teams about is making sure that everybody that we are interacting with, that you're treating them with compassion, with dignity, and, and that you're empathizing with their situation. Because when you get to know people's stories, um, they're not so different from you and I. And, and you know, we get the question off um, asked so often, um, what causes people to become homeless? And there's a, a lot of assumptions of, of the reasons why people become homeless, but the major reason why they do is because it's a, it's a separation from their support system and resources. And when you put it that way, um, it helps you look at things very differently because you and I and many others out there probably had their own struggles with um, financial situations or, you know, employment or, or struggling with rent and, um, or maybe, um, have struggled with, with some minor level of drinking or, or something. Um, and in those tough times, we've been able to lean on family, to lean on friends, um, whether it's staying with family and friends or borrowing money that, have been a resource for us to make sure that we never hit the streets. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that um, we see sometimes are in situations that we, many of us have gone through loss of employment, loss of a loved one. Um, you know, the uh, landlord is increasing rent and they can't keep up with it, but they don't have the same support system. They don't have the same resources that many of us do. And so they're, they end up on the streets. Mm -hmm. And so not assuming uh, what people have gone through is so important in, in our interactions and getting to hear their story. Um, and I think that that is really what, what shifts um, our, our service delivery model because when people feel that they can share their story and they can be heard, it does something. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it restores a sense of dignity. And, and many times when um, we are serving people who have lost a lot of hope, what we encourage our, our teams is to make sure that we continue to to be their champions of hope, that we are not um, giving up on them, and that when they don't believe in themselves, that we continue to push and believe in them. And we've seen many times in situations where there is breakthrough that they eventually begin to, to carry that hope for themselves. And mm -hmm. we've heard countless stories of... Um, uh, of individuals that we've served that said, you know, when PATH first came to us, we didn't believe um, that we were worthy of this resource or I didn't believe that I was, I was able to, um, um, you know, accomplish these, these different things in, in order to get my own place, whether it's employment or getting connected to medical mental health services or substance use services. Um, but it's really um, the interactions that PATH has with the clients that we serve that many times empowers them to engage in services that they were once uh, reluctant to. Does it take a lot of effort to earn someone's trust? Like, are you, is, are your outreach specialists targeting someone and hitting them up every day or like how yeah. I just imagine if I was, if I had been homeless for a long time, I would be very resistant to right. someone coming in and trying to change my life. Right. right. I can imagine that it must be difficult. It is challenging. I mean, you will see some people who, you know, upon one interaction will say, yes, I want the help. Really? You know, and then you'll see some people that it will take 90 days. It will take, you know, it'll take 40 uh, or four months. And we've seen some people where it's taking them years upon years, you know, and so it really kind of just depends on the experiences that they've gone through um, and the level of, um, of caution that they may have. And, and what I always try to remind people is that uh, when, when people are reluctant to engage in services, we, we have to be mindful of not knowing what their experiences were. And like many of us, again, in our, in our personal lives, and I always try to bring it back to like what we go through in our personal mm -hmm. lives to make it more relatable, um, that when many of us are let down by um, 
you know, a relationship or let down by an experience that we had with a favorite department store or grocery store or something, we hang on to that experience. And, mm-hmm. and oftentimes that experience drives whether or not we decide to engage with another relationship again or that department store or that grocery store, or whatever, whatever it is that you, that you had experienced. And how, um, how you interpret that experience is what we need to be mindful of as providers and kind of going into it knowing that it might take a long time to actually bust through um, that, that, that barrier in entering into a relationship where there's a sense of rapport and trust. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we, we always like to tell um, people that like you really have to look at it on an individual basis. It's very, very rare that you actually have a lot of success engaging somebody on the first encounter. We, yeah. we see that the longer that they've been on the streets, um, that usually takes a, a much longer period of time. Yeah. Does that have any impact on success rate in the program? If someone is um, excited to get on board and get help right away versus someone who is a little more hesitant at first, does that have any relation to how likely a person is to see it through? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's, I don't know if we have a lot of data to, uh, support that. Um, but anecdotally, what I would probably say is that we do see that, um, where there's trust and, and, and rapport and a relationship between the service provider and the clients, that there's a more, uh, uh, desire and willingness to continue to engage in services in the long term, Mm. which creates long term sustainability and success. Um, There are some clients that see the values, um, see the value in services uh, upon um, the get go, upon the initial interaction, and they do really, really well engaging in services. Um, uh, But there might be some that 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 see the opportunity to get assistance that they that they need such as housing and employment, uh, but may not necessarily see um, or have that connection with the service provider the long term. You know, mm-hmm. So it really kind of varies from individual to individual. Um, but I think the relationship between the service provider and uh, the person experiencing homelessness seeking help is so critical to the long term success. Yeah. Is that, are you guys having to fight a perception, a misguided perception of what a homeless service is with homeless people today from, and what is that from, if so? I don't think, uh, you know, it's, I think there certainly are some misperceptions and I don't think it's necessarily with um, one particular group in general. I think that there's sometimes an assumption that if you offer somebody help right away, and this is coming more, more from like the non-homeless service provider world so the public perspective yeah that if you have services to offer somebody right away that they're going to take it mm-hmm. and 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 what we're seeing is that many times that's just not the case because there's just too many variables and so there needs to be more attention focused on um when services are there like how do we bridge people to the services and, mm-hmm. and is that through street outreach is that through um, more partnerships you know but on, on the homeless services side, for those people who have um, chronic um, history of being on the streets, I do think that it is a challenge to show um, how is this this encounter, how is this experience going to be different from, you know, all the other encounters I've had the past, you know, three, four, five, 15, 20, 30 years that I've been on the streets, because we do see a lot of people who have been on the streets for that period of time. What's a what's a. Uh, a forgettable or bad encounter like mm-hmm. um you know we always um believe that even a, a bad encounter can be something you can work past a bad encounter can just somebody saying saying you know what i don't want your help i'm not interested right just turning you down right away just turning it down right away yeah. but but in those circumstances what um, we try to do is to continue to have a presence and see the person say hello just acknowledge him and if they're saying they're not interested in services, let's just get to know them, mm-hmm. you know, and, and sometimes through getting to know them, we can figure out other ways to provide them the assistance and support that they want. Mm-hmm. You know, we actually had um, uh, somebody that we were working with not too long ago um, that we assumed uh, wanted um, uh, their own home. They wanted their own apartment. 
And they were really reluctant to want to engage with us. And, but we continued to get to know them. And eventually she shared, um, you know, like, look, I don't want my own home because I feel like I'm struggling with addiction right now, but I don't know how to access residential treatment because it's just too complicated. And so when we pumped the brakes and said, okay, you know what, we're not going to focus on that. We're going to figure out how to get you into residential treatment. A completely uh, a change the engagement process and, mm-hmm. and her buy-in and uh, by supporting her priorities again it's about supporting their priorities yeah um you know that's going to lead to her ultimate long-term success because um you know she was using as a means of coping with being on the streets but mm-hmm. her, her priority was to stop her addiction um so she can have long-term uh permanent housing what is Path's view on giving housing to people who are struggling with addiction? Our organization uh, follows evidence-based practices. And what that basically means is the same way that you and I go into a doctor and they prescribe us medication. Um, if our doctor were to tell us that the medication they're prescribing us has never been researched, um, the probability of us taking that that medication is is highly unlikely. Mm. Um, and uh, and so so doctors only pr- prescribe medication that has evidence behind it and research behind it to uh, prove its effectiveness. And the homeless services organization or field, I should say. We, we practice the same thing. So a lot of the interventions that we use are evidence-based. It's, it's been proven. Mm-hmm. And so um, we actually use a approach that we refer to as, as housing first. And, and housing first uses a, um, a, a harm reduction model, meaning that we are, um, we are looking to, to meet people's most basic needs before we're addressing uh, a number of the other issues that are going on within their lives. Because what research has shown us is that for people who are experiencing um, uh, medical and mental health issues and struggling with sobriety, it is really difficult for them to address those issues um, when they're not getting the most basic needs met, which is having a roof over their head. Because um, uh, they're more concerned about you know their survival and day to day, and sometimes um, you know their their uh, use of of alcohol or other substances um, is a sci- uh, survival technique. Mm-hmm. Um, what what a lot of people are not aware of is people who are on the street. Sometimes they're um, they may be using a substance such as meth to help them um, stay awake at night so they can protect themselves, you know, or sometimes when people who are struggling with mental illness who um, are hearing voices and they think those voices are real and the only way they know how to, how to numb them out is by maybe using substances that might have some sort of impact on the voices. There's others who are not connected to medical services and, and, and they are experiencing a lot of real physical pain and the only way for them to know how to numb that pain is by the use of alcohol or other drugs to help kind of drown that pain. Mm-hmm. And so when you say to someone, we will help you, but we're going to require for you to be sober, what you're really doing is stripping away the only way that they know how to cope with their with their struggles. And so um, housing first and harm reduction, what, that's, what, what that philosophy is, it's saying we're going to help you regardless of, um, you know, regardless if you want to address your medical, mental health, or substance use issues. And once we get you in your own home, we're going to surround you with services that are going to then help address um, the issues that we know exist. And, and, and the research does show that when you're able to put somebody into their own place with a roof over their own head, they become very more likely to want to address medical, mental health, and substance use. Is that what you see in practice is people are more willing to address an addiction after they have addressed a uh, roof over their head, as you say. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and there's all sorts of, of stories that we have with people who, um, you know, move into their own place and, and, and that sense of being in their own home creates a desire to want to continue to improve their lives.